Welcome to the start of the final plenary session for the conference. And once again, thank you all for coming and making it a really great conference. As I said at the start, um, no matter how well organized the conference was, it, it doesn't work if you all don't come and take the time and, and make the investment to, to make the papers and, and panels that you've made. Um, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce both of these speakers, but in particular to introduce the first. Um, I'd like to be indulged a little bit to speak about him. Um, and I've organized this, so you're going to have to listen to it anyway. Um, I have a joke, and I don't know if Bill knows, knows about it. I don't think I've ever told it in front of him. And I hope he'll appreciate it. And I think anybody who's been an academic for a long time and has had lots of students will appreciate it. I've known William Connolly for 30 years, but Bill's known me for 28 because it took him two years to remember my name. And I, 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 I was a freshman when I took my first course with him, and for two years, was, what was your name again? What, what year are you in? Um, but for all 30 of those years, he's, he's been a really incredible um, mentor to me, uh, intellectually, uh, professionally, also personally, as a, as a friend. Um, and it was with Bill that I, I got introduced to Nietzsche and Foucault, and also to Deleuze and Guattari, who he was just starting to read in uh, graduate courses that I was taking as an undergraduate. And then I moved over, over here over to the UK, and I, I was kind of independently reading Deleuze, and, and so was he in, in America, but we kept in touch and, and you know, had many great conversations as we were both kind of exploring what was for both of us new territory. Um, and you know, he introduced me to my PhD supervisor. He provided me with invaluable uh, professional advice. Um, anybody who, who's been a student of Bill's knows the kind of advice that he can give and, and how valuable it is. And also, as I say, uh, personal advice. I mean. Bill is one of a small number of people who have listened to me and really helped me out um, through difficult periods in, in my life as well. Um, I have a joke that I tell my students, and some of you have heard this in the camp, which is that every student who studies with me gets free lifetime divorce advice. And <laughs> given the fact that 50% of the people who try the marriage route will need the advice, it's really valuable. It's a very good investment. Um, but if there's a serious thing behind the joke, which maybe I tell once a few times too often. It's that um, when somebody helps you, I think what's important, the way you thank them is, is you don't reciprocate. Um, you can thank them by reciprocating, but you help the next person who needs help. And I mean, I think that's, aside from the definition of ethics is that we have to become worthy of what happens to us. I think the other side of that is you have to help the next person as a way of thanking the person who helped you. So I always do have that in mind. Um, when, when, when these things happen. So, and you know, when I'm dealing with my students who sometimes it takes me two years to remember their names. So, um, William Connolly is the Krieger Eisenhower Professor at Johns Hopkins University. Krieger Eisenhower Professor of Political Theory, I should have said, at uh, Johns Hopkins University, where he um, is, uh, has been teaching political theory since I think 1986, 85. He's a former editor of the journal Political Theory and is one of several founders of the online journal Theory and Event. He is the author, by my count, of 17 books, one of which is co-authored, including highly influential works like The Terms of Political Discourse, Identity Difference, Democratic Negotiations of Political Paradox. And you prove, you demonstrate that you are a connoisseur of Connolly if you know the way that the slash is meant to go on that book. Um, and uh, and uh, neuropolitics, thinking culture, speed, also the ethos of pluralization which came earlier than neuropolitics. His more recent publications include The Fragility of Things in 2013, Facing the Planetary, Entangled Humanism in the Politics of Swarming, 2017, and also in 2017, a small book, Aspirational Fascism. Um, his new little book, he says, Climate Machines, Fascist Drives and Truth, will appear in the early fall of this year. So. I'd like to welcome Bill. Thanks, uh, Nathan, for such a uh, generous uh, introduction. And uh, it puts a lot of pressure on the speaker when somebody does that. But uh, I can handle pressure, so I think it'll be OK. Uh, and I would also like to join in thanking Nathan for organizing this conference. It's been superb, and, and the support, the staff support has been amazing here. And also to 
uh, thank uh, Ian Buchanan for keeping this organization going at such a high level for so many years. There are many other things that one could say, but I think uh, Beth will be the last speaker, so uh, I'll let her take that out of her time. No, uh, but, the, the, uh, but uh, thanks to, to everybody. Uh, so, um, to inhabit the geological era, recently known as the Anthropocene, is not to live during a time when, as if uh, flouting millions of years of long, slow change in oceans, species evolution, climate, glaciers, monsoons and deserts, humanity writ large suddenly became a geological force. Such a statement makes two mistakes, as you know. The assumption of planetary gradualism with which it starts, and the charge of generic human responsibility with which it closes. Geology, paleontology, oceanography, glaciology, and other earth sciences, starting as late as the 1980s, which is pretty late, finally exploded the story of planetary gradualism uh, that has too often informed the earth sciences and set the backdrop for Eurocentric social theory and philosophy. It is an interesting question. What kind of metaphysical and cosmological assumptions in Christian providentialism and in its remainders in secular philosophical thought made such sciences take so long? Especially when some predecessors in what Deleuze and Guattari call the minor tradition of philosophy or of thought and uh, the names here I will just include are Kropotkin, Cuvier, Mary Shelley, and Nietzsche, had already challenged this view. Second assumption. Humanity did not become a geological force in the modern era. Rather, state capitalism and state communism, organized around internally differentiated priorities of fossil extraction, productivism, and consumption abundance, became major geological forces. So much so obvious, everybody knows it. But I'm not sure that everybody believes it. I'm not sure that everybody believes it in investments in their bodies in the Deleuzean sense of belief. If you interrogate the five great mass extinction events that occurred uh, before these modern systems of political economy triumphed, it also becomes clear how capitalism at all are not the sole geological forces of rapid deep change today either. These modern political economies rather generate climate triggers that can be inflated or dampened by planetary forcings and self-organized or organizing amplifiers. We thus need concepts of cascading causality to explore multiple intersecting planetary uh, trajectories populated with varying degrees of agencies. Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari um, did not examine closely, to my knowledge, the Anthropocene in relation to capitalist and communist practices of productivism. D and G, however, this will save time if I say D and G. D and G, however, did open a wide door to such examinations through a series of concepts that underline how diverse human cultural practices are profoundly entangled with a host of non-human forces and non-human agencies. These concepts together challenge the sufficiency of human exceptionalism, sociocentrism, cultural internalism and planetary gr gradualism that had her heretofore graced much of uh, Euro-American philosophy, the humanities, uh, and the social sciences in the major traditions. Several D and G concepts may be pertinent to the inquiry in question. One pair, smooth and striated space, is exemplary. A few paradigms of smooth space are oceans, deserts, glaciers, mountain ranges, uh, the atmosphere, mist, creative thinking, the stratosphere, steppes, 
and prairies. Several smooth spaces expand or contract over time, making huge differences to possibilities of life in and around them. And I will not review my little bit here on the striations of smooth spaces. These Social inter these interventions themselves compel social thinkers to address the shifting densities and, uh, and, and size of drought zones. So not just geologists or earth scientists, but social thinkers. Uh, drought zones, monsoons, ocean currents, desertification, rates of glacier flow, hurricanes, atmospheric composition, and so forth. DNG thus introduced categories that cut off sociocentrism at the pass. The latter being the quaint idea, perhaps still lingering in some quarters, that key social processes can be explained almost solely by reference to more basic social processes. When you think of how various planetary processes themselves slide and bump into shifting mixtures of social life, other DNG con uh, concepts could present themselves as candidates too. Assemblage, rhizome, multiplicity, body without organs, plane of composition, and abstract machine pop up for possible consideration, maybe in relation to one another. I suspect the idea of an abstract machine may do the most work, however, to rethink the bumpy trajectories of the Anthropocene, even if it needs to be adjusted here and there, partly because of its emphasis on fecund processes that both involve and exceed human powers, and partly because of its focus on temporal forces of heterogeneous types uh, in, in uh, intersections of formation, consolidation, uh, and deconsolidation. A couple of things D and G say are relevant. Abstract machines, quote, are defined by the fourth aspect of assemblages. In other words, the cutting edges of decoding and deterritorialization. Therefore, they make the territorial assemblage open onto something else, assemblages of another um, type, the molecular the cosmic, they constitute becomings, end of quote. And then each abstract machine, it's a quote, when I yell it's usually a quote, each abstract machine can be considered a plateau of variation. An abstract machine thus composes and links heterogeneous temporalities that are self-organizing to various degrees. Uh, and then they say at the last quote, the earth itself is an abstract machine. Quote, it asserts its own powers of deterritorialization. Its lines of flight, its smooth spaces that live and blaze their way for a new earth. Um, so um, here the idea of, as, as you know, the, the idea of a machine with cutting edges and both bumpy self-organizing trajectories challenges both Eurocentric life, non-life dualities, and reductionist philosophies of the old materialisms that sought to uh, overtake them, both, both of them. Now we'll see if I can make this thing work. I'm pretty good at this. Oh, there you go. Uh, an ab abstract machine, in the sense deployed here, includes morphing, uh, moving, morphing planetary com complexes that exceed the power of the ensemble of forces and agencies that constitute it. It is machinic rather than merely mechanistic, cybernetic or organic, in that it evolves new speeds and capacities as it draws energy from uh, earthquakes, capitalist emissions, ocean currents, volcanoes, methane bursts, microbes, and the sun to cut into prior stabilizations. It is planetary in this instance, in that it imposes asymmetrical regional, racial, class, and species consequences on the entire face of the Earth. It is abstract, although this is the one that I don't feel the most confident about, it is abstract in that it is irreducible to the multitude of forcings and agencies that compose it, 
such as, say, capitalism, white evangelicalism, techno, techno-scientific formations, imperial patterns of trade and finance, tectonic plates, cultural resentment, species evolution, viral and bacterial flows, desert advances, ocean currents, acidification, and glacier flows. And it is complex in that the heterogeneous forces that compose it impinge upon each other, periodically infuse one another, and respond to such ingressions into themselves in ways that exceed the power of the triggers, doing so to endow the self-organizing machine with evolving shapes, speeds, and trajectories. I have little titles, and the next one is called Capitalism in the Anthropocene. I understand with D and G, capitalism to involve imperfect, uh, to be contained by a shifting axiomatic that exceeds both the determinant mode of production and the rationality of impersonal market processes. The axiomatic, in its morphing shapes, enables some activities, constrains others, and captures many. Such an image of capitalism may outstrip any mode of economism, partly because it includes shifting spiritualities that infuse institutions of production, investment, governance, class struggle, and consumption, and partly because it encounters planetary forces with self-amplification powers that enable, jostle, and jolt it in multifarious ways. The bumpy relations between an axiomatic and the outside often compel a regime to search and grope in the dark as new events unfold or erupt. You might call that the political dimension. One capitalist uh, axiomatic of enablement and constraint can consist of private ownership of uh, uh, private ownership and pursuit of profit, uh, a focus on fossil fuel extraction, a commodity form of consumption, labor pushed kicking and screaming toward the commodity form, states organized uh, to differential degrees as servants and or regular regulators of these axioms, and so forth. These ac- axioms can be augmented or contracted to foster temporal and regional diversities within capitalism. A few of the variations might take the shape of democratic capitalism, in which competing parties shuffle between enthusiastically subordinating themselves to the powers of the axiomatic, that's where I live, and regulating it to protect workers, consumers, public goods, and non-human species. Or it can take the shape of fascist capitalism, in which a dictatorial party mobilizes uh, intense factions to guide private capital and to exercise terror surveillance and racist control over others. It can take the shape of Keynesian uh, capitalism, which I won't explain to you, and it can take the shape of neoliberal capitalism in which democracy becomes hollowed out, corporate regulations are stripped, state subsidies for capital flourish, and a myth or overcording of market rationality is invoked to vindicate those practices. Under situations of stress, um, neoliberal uh, capitalism can migrate towards uh, fascist capitalism, uh, as occurred after the first, uh, uh, after the Great Depression, Depression in several states, and as a host of new social movements Uh, drive to accomplish today in USA, Poland, Hungary, and the list goes on, Italy. The racial dog whistles, oh yeah, well so, those are the two conspirators. One is looking menacingly at the other because he's the agent of Compromat and uh, he's the one who's worried about it. Uh, And they together were uh, deeply involved in reshaping uh, the American election. Uh, the, the guilt is there, it just hasn't been uh, demonstrated to enough people yet. Um, several states, okay, yeah. Uh, so the racial dog whistles and uh, thinly denied white triumphalism that marked neoliberalism now become bullhorns. 
big lies, aggressive nationalism, uh, voter suppression, uh, conspiracies with foreign powers to shape elections, corruption of courts, intelligence agencies, and judicial policies, harsh policing of territorial borders, market testing of ever new modes of cruelty, and media intimidation now attain new heights of intensity. The big lie scenario plays an outsized role in such regimes. I don't use the word populism to describe the right. Uh, neoliberal, neo-fascist. I think populism is a bad mistake. The key connections between extractive capitalism, the galloping anthro Anthropocene, and neo-fascist movements in old democratic capitalist states today and tomorrow are perhaps these. First, climate warming, drought, stuttering monsoons, glacier melts, wildfires, extreme storms, and so on, press upon vulnerable and exploited regions, increasing pressure to civil wars and forced migrations. The resulting racialized refugee pressures upon old capitalist states keep hant, hep, I'm sorry, keep, create happy hunting grounds for the purveyors of aspirational fascism, that is, those who would promote a fascist regime if they can get away with it. Second, as those fans, fans are flamed by aspirational fascism, with Donald Trump being a, a leading carrier, white workers and the lower middle class in deindustrialized zones are told that only by uh, returning with a vengeance to the old golden days of fossil fuel extraction, steel and automobile production, imperial exploitation, and white triumphalism can they hope to regain the levels of entitlement acquired precariously in the 1950s and 60s. This combination pull some to embrace cl climate denialism and an authoritarian leader, and it encourages others, particularly in the white upper middle and donor classes, to fund such expressions of public belief to fend off any challenges from the left. White triumphalism and climate denialism today thus support one another, even though they may not require one another. Um, so that's, that's why it might be best to support a series of rapid, positive interim policies and practices to start current capitalist states first, past extractive capitalism, and second, beyond a class organization of acquisitive desires joined to the differential ability of people in different subject positions to fulfill them. Today, the, given the urgency of time, and the resentments of several neglected constituencies, uh, these, these kinds of actions and these kinds of social movements, I'll say a little bit of, about the latter in a moment, or a few moments, assume what I call the character of an improbable necessity. Not probabilistic, unrealistic, but it's, it's much more unrealistic not to promote or pursue them. Capitalism, with its endemic pressures to expand growth, exploit nature, workers, and consumers, uh, gener uh, generate crises and deploy fossil fuels, thus plays the crucial, a crucial role in the advance of the Anthropocene. But other forces also make signal contributions to its tra trajectory and to its acceleration. Indeed, capitalist states very significantly uh, in the extent to which they continue down the extractive course. Uh, for example, in the United States, the addition of white evangelicalism to neoliberalism in the early 1980s generated a kind of uh, neoliberalism that was much more virulent than most of it, uh, the European, uh, its European counterparts because the evangelical neoliberal resonance machine was a distinctive formation involving the spiritual and the uh, economic tied together. Put another way, as the evangelical neoliberal resonance machine slides today toward an embrace of neo-fascist capitalism, uh, climate denialism or casualism, one or the other, become essential axioms of that assemblage. 
Okay, so now I wanted to get to the, the meat of the paper. Uh, and, and so the title of this is called The Late Antique Little Ice Machine. It's a machine. Um, so we can gain a preliminary sense of how capitalism is exceeded by the climate dynamic to which it makes a signal contribution by intending to other times when rapid climate change was in play before either state capitalism or state communism existed. We need not turn merely to the period 250 million years ago when 90% of life was extinguished. There weren't many capitalists around then. Or 66 million years ago when 50% 50 of life was eliminated. Though these, cask these previous cascading processes are very pertinent to those operative today. We need to understand them to the extent we can to understand our situation. We can take a closer look at the fall of Rome. According to Kyle Harper, in the fate of Rome, the Roman, uh, 2016 I think, the Roman climate optimum, optimum lasted from about two, 200 BCE to about 150 uh, CE. That period was suitable for lavish crops, population growth, and imperial expansion. The late, then, the late antique little ice age, I didn't know about this ice age, hardly anybody did until Harper wrote about it, although a few earth scientists have started talking about it very, very recently. Uh, the, the late antique little ice age, uh, a, a recently discovered climate machine, started later and coalesced with the devastating plagues induced by the unwitting importation of black rats and fleas from the east through the consolidation of new trading routes. These two events further weakened the empire. Such bacterial, insect, animal, and climate ingressions into the empire, of course, mean that purely hermeneutic or sociocentric approaches to its decline do not suffice. The participants themselves had little idea of the sources of the plague. They knew they had a plague, but little idea of the sources, and no idea at all of the source the sources of the climate change. Many sought the sources in divine judgments and punishments. Indeed, the rapid growth of Constantinian Christianity in Rome correlates loosely, this is Harper that I'm ventriloquating, you know what I mean, first with the dates of pestilence and later with climate change, perhaps in part because that version of Christianity could blame the suffering on the weakness of the pagan gods the desert of Romans, a second coming was promised, and the capacity of an omnipotent God to overcome the two phenomena with a blissful afterlife. So I'll just read one quotation from uh, Harper. The natural catastrophes of the six centuries induce one of the greatest mood swings in human history. The, the occlusion of the sun, the rattling of the earth, and the advent of worldwide plague stoked the fires of eschatological expectation across the wor Christian world and beyond. So we discern here a, 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 the outlines of a Christian Roman or Christian imperial complex. How, though, did the late antique little ice age, already simmering, acquire mom more momentum in 536 AD and surge uh, until around 545? creating cold years that apparently outstripped the now better known Little Ice Age uh, in Europe reaching its own peak in the 17th century. It went on after that, but that was its peak. Recent geological, ice core, isotope, chronicle, and tree ring evidence suggests that the antique Little Ice Age was intensified by a massive volcano in 536 CE that released huge amounts of sulfur into the stratosphere. This shift in climate bolstered the cyclical sun dimming that was already in play, and soon thereafter was intensified by another yet larger volcano in uh, South Africa. 
in ways that Harper tries to explain the next great plague correlated with those events. I won't try to explain it. Uh, so, um, I was just, I was, there's a little summary here, but I think I'll, uh, I'll move to this, this section so we can get to, to the amplifiers, which is what I really want to talk about. One more thing before we depart Rome. As Catherine Keller, a theologian, kind of a Whiteheadian theologian with affinities to Deleuze, argues in Political Theology of the Earth, it is pertinent to attend to a series of loose historical relays and reverberations between the Roman Church's insistence that God created the world from nothing, the, the parallel Constantine draws between a sovereign God and himself as emperor, the unity soon demanded between emperor and, and Christian faith by Justinian, the later rise of Calvinism, uh, the, the transfiguration of theologies of divine omnipotence by Carl Schmitt into a secular doctrine in which the, the state sovereign becomes he who decides. White evangelical demands in America for identity between Constantinian doctrine and a white Christian nation. Uh, capitalist firms imposing authoritarian controls over workers. And fascist movements demanding sovereign unquestioned rule over an entire people. This is certainly not to say that there is a single straight line running from the first pattern of insistence to later assertions of, of ruthless sovereign entitlement. These are a rather loose lineages of association, inspiration, and reverberation. Some themes and associations dissipate for a while and then assume new intensities under novel or new conditions of stress. Today, when, peop when many people again worry about the shaky place of humanity in the cosmos, old patterns of insistence floating around loosely in several doctrines, spiritualities, and institutions may find new modes of expression. Some tr such transfigurations can attract large constituencies uh, under uh, uh, stress, especially if the social disciplines to which they are subjected make them amenable to that kind of response. The danger of fascism now is bound immediately to white resentment in several old capitalist states against growing refugee pressures, which will accelerate due to the close relation between regional drought, other things, and civil war. A deep, longer-range source of the danger is lodged in the fact that the future promises extractive capitalism advances to maintain its legitimacy and hegemony are based upon desperately protected, institutionalized assumptions and priorities at odds with the acceleration of the Anthropocene. We can perhaps draw a few of these threads together by suggesting that, well, I should have, I, there, that was, yeah, there it was. It was a good book by uh, Theology of the Earth. I like the book a lot. I don't agree with it, but I like it a lot. We can uh, perhaps draw some of these threads together by suggesting why neither the Anthropocene as a unique planetary configuration nor the theme of the Capitalocene may be quite up to the functions uh, each is called upon to pr perform today. The focus for the moment is upon the latter. In an impressive and provocative book entitled uh, Capitalism uh, in the Web of Nature, Jason Moore calls upon us to replace the story of the Anthropocene with the Capitalocene. The former label is too generic. The new term allows us to concentrate how a new political economy, capitalism, became the major geological force on the earth for the first time in history. The golden spike, he says, started in 1610 with the conquest and holocaust in South America. Moore then goes on to show how to sustain these patterns of growth under unfavorable conditions, advanced capitalist states 
have been pressed to create cheap natures through high-tech inventions to reduce especially the cost of agribusiness but other modes of production and, and to maintain profits. So far, so illuminating and so pertinent. Nevertheless, there are limits to the analysis as, as offered to date. First, the spiritual and existential components of the cultural processes are underplayed in this book as the critical emergen uh, emergencies of Constantinianism, the role of capitalism in, in, in industrial, northern industrial capital, and then later the emergence of the neoliberal uh, evangelical capitalist residence machine, all three illustrate. Second, the text tends to draw attention from the critical role of large planetary self-organizing amplifiers today in the Gallup of the Anthropocene, a theme that we will come to next. Third, its proponents may not acknowledge sufficiently the need to rethink 19th century counter ideals of productive growth, consumption abundance, and smooth community embedded in some versions of socialist and communist thought. These are some reasons that make me hesitate uh, over the term capitalist scene. That being said, uh, I uh, learned from those who organized their thinking around the capitalist scene. Uh, and uh, since I believe that you need pluralist alliances of militant action today, I welcome coalitions with them. So this is the last section, I think. The Anthropocene as Planetary Machine. Climate as machine, periodically evolving and morphing in its dominant components, speeds, and trajectories, is imbricated with a host of planetary and cosmic forces. The example of Rome helps to teach that lesson. We can think of the cyclical intensities of sunspot formation, uh, the elliptical pattern of the Earth's rotation, the wobble of the earth and the periodic shift in its tilt, call these cyclical forcings. There are also intermediate or intermittent asteroid showers, changes in the ratio of oxygen to, uh, to carbon and nitrogen, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, hurricanes, wildfires, and tsunamis. These form less uh, cyclical and predictable modes of non-human uh, volatility. Call them non-cyclical drivers. Any conjunction between a forcing and a driver can introduce uh, dramatic effects as it changes the climate machine. Uh, as the self-organizing history of ice ages, interglacial periods, extinction events, monsoon interruptions, desertification, the ocean conveyor, and sharp turns in species evolution show and as the rapid organization of the uh, late antique Little Ice Age shows once again. The ocean conveyor system, for instance, was consolidated millions of years ago, well after the oceans had been formed. And before humans appeared, uh, before humans, I'm sorry, uh, 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 appeared to think of themselves as potential masters of the earth. The conveyor carries warm surface water from the Gulf of Mexico north through toward Greenland where cooling, more saline water dives down in a spinning fashion to flow south along the ocean floor until it reaches the Indian Ocean. There the heating water rises again to the surface toward, to flow toward the north. It is a conveyor formed originally out of dissonant connections between climate wind, currents, gravity, the Coriolis effect, and shifting water densities. It also closed down 12,700 years ago with uh, severe effects on North America and uh, what you now call the United Kingdom. Uh, and this flow was stopped. There are debates as to how and why it stopped. The Gulf Stream is currently at its weakest level in the last 1,600 years. The, oh, the vicissitudes of the, uh, that, that's kind of a really crude but 
uh, overarching map of the ocean conveyor system, worldwide system. The vicissitudes of the ocean conveyor provide merely one sign of how differentials of latitude uh, create a highly imperfect index of climate differentials. The first European invaders of Jamestown and St. Augustine in North America encountered huge problems because the invaders had ac anchored their seasonal estimates of temperature and precipitation on an assumed parallel between latitude and climate. In fact, probably due to a slowing ocean conveyor, the late 16th and 17th century Euro uh, invaders encountered a little ice age. The places they so ruthlessly invaded were much colder and is, uh, inhospitable to their practices of food production than anticipated. Let's, let's narrow the focus now to explore uh, contemporary intersections between less cyclical uh, non-human amplifiers and the triggers of extractive capitalism. So we have triggers, forcings, drivers, and amplifiers. That's what we're talking about now. Uh, we know what the triggers are, so I'm going to get to the amplifiers. Uh, in the, uh, the text from which this is taken, there are 15 of them. Uh, I, for your uh, convenience, and because I'm merciful, I'm only listing eight of them at the moment. Eight. So a short list of self-organizing climate amplifiers. Melted ice absorbs much more solar heat than solid ice to place a glacier melt, uh, melt rate on a self-governing, self-promoting spiral. Rivers formed on top of, of melting glaciers dive through crap, cracks and gaps, moulins, in the ice to create flotillas upon which the glacier now slides more rapidly. That one is during the frozen season, but you see its size, and then in the, in the summertime, water's rushing into it. Freezing water in the moulins and crevices following summer melts exploded the Antarctic Larsen B shelf in three days in 2002, when glaciologists had previously thought it would take 70 years or more. I don't know if I have that shelf over there. Okay, so it's, the, the shelf, it was, it's gone, it's up there uh, uh, a ways. Here's another one that it is likely to go very soon. The breakup of the West Antarctic ice shelf, which is, that's the larger shelf, uh, the most recent uh, break-off was the size of Delaware, eliminates old bul bulwarks against accelerated movement of the continental glacier. The heating of oceans and tundra from accumulated CO2 emissions could release frozen methane calthrates in the tundra and in ocean crystals, further accelerating warming, as may have happened during the great extinction event 250 million years ago after the eruption of the Siberian flats. There's, that's one of the Siberian flats that warmed things up. A lot of other things happened, and, and, and then you had the, the greatest extinction event. As the Greenland uh, glacier melt accelerates, the large pools of water allow algae to cover more of its surface, reducing the albedo effect, that's reflection rate of the sun, from 90% to under 20% and further speeding up the glacier melt. Melting glaciers in Greenland could possibly disrupt or stop the key downward thrust of the ocean conveyor system at its most vulnerable point near Greenland, as the melts pour fresh water onto the ocean surface lighter than the salty cold water. I have a few more. I'm getting bored with them myself, but I, 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 know, I know you are, but Two more, I think. The expansion of drought in the sub-Saharan African horn press suffering grazers and farmers to cut down more vegetation or flee, decreasing further the CO2 absorptive capacities in the land, promoting civil wars, and increasing refugee pressures, perhaps also fostering the danger of fascist contagions in the receiving regimes. Intensification of periodic El Ninos 
through climate warming in the Pacific could interrupt monsoon seasons over India and China, placing huge populations at risk. Such interruptions have occurred before. Uh, and they could, uh, of course, if they occur, in, uh, unleash a whole series of volatile uh, re responses and refugee drives. Uh, there's another one, uh, and, and uh, I should have put the acidification on the list because there's a new report this morning that the acidification issue is much larger than the climate scientists had thought three weeks ago. But, I, but uh, I'm not. These self-organizing amplifiers bump and fold into each other as they form an abstract machine with several cultural spiritualities and capitalist triggers already noted. They accentuate pressures on capitalist states to change their ways very rapidly or to fend off growing refugee pressures, intensify racism, build territorial walls, and forge fascist responses to an accelerating climate machine. The machine itself is, formed, is, is forged by uh, movements back and forth between the entrenched priorities of ex extractive capitalism, the growing lead times between drilling and production, wh uh, white raison to maw, neoliberal hubris, race and class exploitation, imperial drives, hungry dispossessed peoples, impositions of selective austerity, growing fossil fuel emissions, agricultural deforestation, uh, and the, the others on the list I've already mentioned, ocean shifts, spiraling glacier melts, and so forth. The interacting triggers and amplifiers in motion mean that even a radical reduction in atmospheric emissions today, the triggers, would not be matched soon by a parallel reduction in warming. Um, uh, drought relief or rousing seas or extreme storms or forest fires or species losses. But it is possible to slow down its acceleration. That's the point where we are. This machine is well underway. Through an activist assemblage of critical constituencies mobilized across several regions, several countries and regions, to demand radical re reworking of capitalist institutions of investment, production, and consumption by retooling the ugly spiritual eth ethos that now occupies most of those institutions, and by act enactment of mitigation and reparation payments to reg regions that have contributed the least and suffer the most at the moment from the planetary machine. The formula would be to put internal and external pressures on key states, corporations, churches, universities, localities, regions, and units and unions at the same time, hopefully reaching a point soon where you have cross-regional climate strikes. This is a foolish idea. Uh, it's also a necessary idea. It's what I've been uh, calling lately uh, improbable necessity. If and as these modes of cross-regional active, uh, activism gain traction, uh, Critical thinkers may also need to rework creatively a series of contending 19th century ideals of material abundance and spiritual hubris. Fascism can fill the vacuum if, when democratic capitalism founders, familiar non-capitalist ideals have not retooled or refurbished themselves enough to speak to the ongoing planetary machine they too may require some degree of reconstitution du during an, uh, an era of capitalist institution of mastery over nature, asymmetries of regional suffering, and the radical expansion of planetary amplifiers. Uh, it, is it is time to become worthy of the planetary. Thank you.
thank you, Bill, for a terrific talk. Um, I now feel that I'm no longer the gloomiest guy at this conference. Um, so that's something to be uh, happy about. So my question is, uh, you kind of deal with a lot of um, sort of scientific uh, uh, ways of describing and evidence for transformation. And there's a kind of implicit um, suggestion that these uh, changes in the environment, et cetera, et cetera, may or may not have uh, social and political effects. But I am, I guess, a little bit curious and perhaps a little bit um, uh, troubled by the, the, the sort of the, the implicit connection between one and the other. It's almost as if you're saying, you know, climate change is going to cause that. And I, and I don't think you are saying that, but I, I don't quite follow exactly how you're suggesting the changes in the environmental systems will filter into social and cultural uh, systems. So I'm very interested in that particular connection. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, no, I don't, I'm not saying that uh, it necessarily will happen or that has to happen. And if each place that you identify the dangerous possibility, you, you might list the bifurcation point and, and think about several other possibilities that are very, uh, very possible. Uh, but I, didn't, I haven't done that in this paper. Uh, because, because it is true that I'm trying to engage with the, with the rethinking of causality so that the one doesn't cause the other and the one isn't implicit in the other. Uh, but my strategy in this paper, which I'm afraid is abundantly clear, is to focus on the danger. To focus on the danger so that when, uh, when I tried to tell my friends uh, I'm a working class boy from Flint, Michigan. When I tried to tell my friends that Trump had a good shot to win the election, uh, they said, no, you're just foolish. You're, I know you're a political theorist. You've got to learn how to read polls. You, that's, you're wrong. And, and uh, they, I think, didn't have a clue about the dangers and that took them by surprise. I, I keep hearing it on the media now. We were all surprised by this. So my focus is on pointing to the dangers so that we can think about the possible modes of response. And I do think that the dangers are so severe. That's why I, that's, that, that's why I don't use the word populism. Uh, I might use it sometimes, but uh, that's why I do think the dangers are so severe and that, that coming to face to face with those dangers might help us, help more of us to, to think about the kind of improbable necessities of action to pursue today. So I entirely agree with you that, that the bifurcation points are not focused upon in this paper. And it's partly strategic, partly due to the, uh, the, the time constraints, but it partly due to the limits of my thinking about options. Uh, wonderful talk. Is it on? Yeah. Uh, when I was in graduate school, I read your work uh, about fugitive democracy, and later on I was reading Deleuze and thought about the potential connection with lines of flight. But today I have a different question, which is, you know, uh, this is political philosophy, and what if we have a larger frame of reference, which is cosmology. Um, so I'm referring to the Chinese five element uh, system uh, frame of interpretation. Yeah. Basically, you know, the model is goes that uh, when the heart's fire drives up, and the you know the water of the kidneys uh, descend, the mm -hmm. two do not meet, uh, mm -hmm. which causes the body to get sick and the uh, lungs uh, will get acid. You know. <laughs> yes. Then uh, eventually the uh, kidneys will have to work harder to get rid of the uh, su superfluous acidity. Yes. What, what if we, we imagine the body, the territorial body, as a body, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of the five element theory, you know? Yes. I guess, you know, that's my thought. I don't have a conclusion. I don't know about the correspond correspondences, which is the heart, maybe industrial production. Yeah. The fire drives up, so yeah. the forestry would be 
Forest would be the lungs, you know, the glacier would be the kidneys, you know, things like that. Just yeah. a thought. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the, the, we are with the Luzon Gotari and, and, and with Whitehead and with Nietzsche and then with Taoism and, and other traditions, we are driven to ri make ourselves rise to that level of thinking. And so I, I've, I've been working with those three, and I've been trying to stretch myself out uh, to some others in non-Western traditions, especially people who can get a kind of a simple boy like me get going by saying, hey, uh, uh, here's a comparison between uh, uh, Deleuze, in that book, Deleuze, and Amazonian thought. Or here's a, a comparison between Whitehead and uh, Taoism and so forth. So. Uh, my moves are very amateurish uh, uh, to date, but, but the fact that, uh, oh yeah, at least I'll let you glance at my new book, you know, I mean, it's, I know, self-advertising, but that's, it'll come out uh, in a month. Uh, and so, uh, the, uh, I, th that's one of the ways I'm trying to extend myself in that way, and I'm going to do it. When I first read Deleuze, I read his book on Kant first, because I, had an understanding of Kant. So I'm, I'm trying to spread out by kind of engaging thinkers who already start thinking through these comparisons. It's utterly essential to do for these uh, cross modes of communication that we're looking for. Thank you. Hello. So I'm trying to understand some of the metaphysics that you're doing in this project right now. So tell me if this is a apt or adequate understanding of what you're doing. And I'll use some of my own coordinates because they're more familiar to me. That You don't want us to fall into the trap of saying that all that is sort of happening and changing in our society or on this planet is due to economic processes of capital itself because capital is one among many different kinds of flows and machines that are sort of operating all at once where we don't want to have a deterministic, oh, this is certainly going to happen because these processes are in place attitude, but rather a, there are these different kinds of flows and different kinds of machines that can encounter one another in a contingent manner. And in that contingent encounter, then produce something that's necessary. But is, is that sort of Yes. Distinction, encounter, yeah. and contingency. That's is that some of what you're yeah, going for? Yeah, it's a much for? shorter paper than the one I gave, but yes, it it does it. Yeah. Okay. So and uh, and 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 it isn't. Uh, but also, every time I think about capital, uh, I also want to think about the shifting spiritualities that are invested in it. The, the Weber's mistake was not the discussion of Calvinism and capital in Northern Europe. The mistake was that it became a mechanism and those, th and those as aspects were irrelevant. I'm a non-theist. Uh, when I was a hotshot little boy, I called myself an atheist, but now I'm non-theist because I want it to be contestable. And, and when I was studying the great social theories of the day in the 60s, every single one of the ones I studied assumed that secularism was the wave of the future. They were all full of shit. Uh, uh, and, 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 it was in it, and it shifted radically. So we could think about uh, Habermas's book, which I kind of liked, Legitimation Crisis, and what the options were. He, he didn't see these new rugged spiritualities emerging. So the only way I would try to, or the, one of the ways I try to amend that is to say uh, capitalism itself is, this, is, is a multiplicity of various sorts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had a question about the, the end of the talk concerning strikes. 
Um, from a naive point of view, it seems like if you're on strike in the late 19th century or the early 20th century, you know what you're striking against. You're striking against, for example, horrible factory conditions. Right. Right now, when you go on climate strike, you kind of sort of know what you're striking against, but the problem is that with all these factors, we ne nobody knows what is going to hit us when. So, for example, being from the Netherlands, we don't really know if we're going to sink first, yes. first or if we're going to have extreme drought first. Yes. And the kind of stuff that you would like to do to oppose either is not really compatible with each other. So the question is, how does the fact that you don't really know what comes when concerning the things that you're striking against factor into the kind of way that you would like to think political action in this context? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a fair question. No, I agree with you. Uh, it, it, let, me, let me put it this way. We don't know what exactly is going to happen next. Uh, and, and part of the very character of the machine seems to in incorporate that. There are differences between labor strikes uh, and general strikes, labor strikes aimed at specific things, general strikes that when I put up about from Seattle, that was a general strike demanding a whole set of actions. Uh, and then there are differences between that model of general strikes and the kind of model that I think is actually kind of emerging today, uh, where you uh, have a whole set of, uh, of cross-regional demands that you make on states to change the infrastructure of consumption, to change the power grid, to, uh, uh, to uh, alter uh, patterns of investment. You have a whole set of interim demands. And during the period of the strike, you live at a subsistence level so that you freeze consumption. So that, that, so that uh, when my daddy was on, he was a laborer, when he was on strike, you know, they didn't want to reduce consumption. They, they had other, reason, other things to do, but this, is a, this would be a different thing. It has to have a different model of a general strike. And, and it, it has to emerge, but the, its most promising feature was that it puts internal and external pressure on states at the same time and reduces the risks of punishment for people who are taking the lead and so forth. Uh, but your, your initial point, I'm with you. We don't know quite what's going to happen next. Today, I read the summary of a new article by a climate scientist who said, you know what, we had our consensus about what is happening with ocean acidification. That was the example I didn't use. He said, I'm sorry to say, we were wrong, it's far worse. And, and here's what I'm here to tell you. I've been reading this stuff and the computer models are always five to six, seven years behind. And there are a lot of good reasons for that. And they don't think they're behind at the time. Uh, so generic actions is what, is what I would say. Not, not to aim, well, this is going to be the thing. You know, uh, you know uh, uh, rebuild Miami, move it. No, no. Changing the, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an improbable task. It may be possible, but it's a necessary task. That's what I think. And I'm right about that. We have time for one more. It's actually quite nice. Sorry, is it working? Okay, like this. Uh, it's actually quite nice that you just ended with the improbable necessity because I had a question about, um, and it kind of relates also to this question of um, if you don't know what to plan for, how do you plan? Because it also seems that you are saying that um, with the improbable ne uh, necessity, it's very unlikely for things to come together in a way that's actually useful. But then how can you motivate people to take responsibility and to want to come together and to do something that seems so counterintuitive because it's quite radical because the capitalist the way that capitalism organizes us require is is very different from what you are you're saying is yeah. necessary. So yeah. yes. like yeah. how do you see this kind of going? Yeah. Uh, I see it as very difficult, uh, and, but I don't think that 
I want to I, I, I want to think about it simply and that's why in the first couple sentences talked about we know this but we don't believe it in our bodies so the the kind of installation of these things deeper into uh, human embodiment as, uh, as a, in kind of the Deleuzian model of a pragmatism. I, th I think of him as a pragmatist, really. And uh, uh, so, that, so that you insist upon taking these actions. And then you, you, you think about, you come to terms with, sure, there are self-interests that stop people from pursuing this and pursuing that, but that's not sufficient. And we live in an age of passive nihilism on the, in the middle and on the left. We, we, we live in an age of aggressive nihilism on the right, and we have to understand how these processes of passive nihilism work. And they, it's, you have changed your belief. You thought that I, I used to be sociocentric last week, that's what I was, and n now I'm not sociocentric now, uh, and that's my refined belief. But uh, remains of the old beliefs still persist because the layered of the layering of body brain processes and so you have to find ways to work on and I'm, I'm trying to write it I write about that in this little book to work on those uh, remains the Nietzschean way of putting it is to, for his era was yeah uh, God is dead and then the whisper but the world ought not to be that way and, and Nietzsche says where does that whisper come from what uh, that, that means that this new belief of yours, in our case, it's uh, the climate machine is running rampant, and I say to myself, yeah, yeah, I know it, but as soon as I leave this room, I may not really, I, I may ask, well, why? What's the fuck going on? So, so we have to work on the various levels, and Foucault and Deleuze have micropolitics and tactics of the self to help us to think about how to work on those levels. Uh, and um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have the answer. I don't like to place myself on an optimistic, pessimistic scale. 20 years ago, people would say to me, you're optimistic. I'd say, no, I, 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 I pointed to the danger of fascism if we don't do X and Y and Z. And they'd say, yeah, but you don't believe that. That might have been true, but uh, the... the uh, but I don't like to put myself on that scale. That's why I like to think about an improbable necessity, what it would take to respond in the time that's available. And that's all I know how to do. Thanks for your question. Thanks, Ryan. Yes, okay, thanks. Okay. So, okay, and, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce our last plenary speaker, and before we can close the conference, I'm delighted that we uh, were able to nab and get Beth Lord to agree to come to the conference. Um, Beth Lord is a reader in philosophy at the University of Aberdeen. She's the author of Kant and Spinozism, Transcendental Idealism and Imminence from Jacobi to Deleuze, uh, published in 2011. Spinoza's Ethics, an Edinburgh Philosophical Guide, that's 2010. She's the editor of Beyond Philo of Spinoza, sorry, Beyond Philosophy, 2012, and Spinoza's Philosophy of Ratio, 2018. Uh, her work on Deleuze has focused on his interpretations of Kant and Spinoza, and she's currently writing a book on Spinoza and equality, and will be presenting on Deleuze and Spinoza and equality. So thank you very much. Thank you, Nathan, for that very generous uh, introduction. So as the final speaker at the conference, um, I'd like to spend a few minutes, uh, as tradition dictates, but also as the conference um, really legitimates, to thank the whole conference organizing team. Um, I think this has been an outstandingly well-run, well-facilitated conference. Um, the panels have, have been well chosen to speak to one another. Um, the food and drink have been plentiful and available at the right times of day. These are not minor things, believe me. There's always been enough water glasses and coffee cups and so on. Um, so, so I really want to extend a, a thanks to, to everyone who was involved in organizing and running this. 
Um, since I do have some names here, I'd like to thank uh, Naomi Grotenhuis, Emily Harding, Ian Jacobi, Louis Mathieu, uh, Kinthia Plagianu, Lenka Sukupova, Josephine Taylor, Edward Thornton, David Ventura, Thomas Waterton, the crew on the desk, and the outstanding catering team. Thank you to all of them. And although we've already thanked him once or twice, um, I'd like once again to extend um, a large round of thanks to Nathan. Um, the main conference organizer for an event on this scale um, has a particular burden, <laughs> and a burden that lasts a very long time. It takes a long time and a lot of effort to organize a conference like this. Um, so while that person may not do all of the hands-on work, um, he does carry all of the anxiety about the event going well. So I'd like to thank Nathan Witter for carrying that anxiety for us <laughs> and for an event that has gone extremely well indeed. Thank you, Nathan. Okay. Well, I have not been to Deleuze studies before or to Deleuze and Guattari studies before. Um, I've had a great experience here the last few days. And I have learned an enormous amount. Um, and one of the nice things about presenting last is that I've sort of been able to incorporate things that I've learned <laughs> into my own paper. So if you hear things that sound familiar, bits of your own papers, for, for example, or other papers you've heard, um, that will not be an accident. I, I've, been, I've been picking things up as I, as I went along. Um, so for Deleuze, the critique of transcendence is not only an ontological matter, but a political one too. A philosophy of immanence rejects a transcendent creator and affirms a conception of being that is itself dynamic and productive. Being primarily generates relations rather than individual entities, and it's these constitutive relations rather than a transcendent authority that generate social and political systems. In a philosophy of immanence, ontology is therefore practical. Being generates ethical, social, and political relations and systems. And Deleuze takes Spinoza to offer just such a philosophy of imminence, a practical philosophy in the title of his little Spinoza book, in which our role is to develop positive ways of living through experimentation with the constitutive relations our minds and bodies make possible. Deleuze's, uh, sorry, Deleuze's interpretation of Spinoza begins with metaphysics in Spinoza et le problème de l'expression, translated into English as expressionism in philosophy Spinoza. In this text, he interprets Spinoza's concept of being in terms of three guiding principles of univocity, expression, and imminence. I will argue here that Deleuze's metaphysical interpretation of Spinoza is already shot through with political connotations. Deleuze implies that a specific type of politics is built into Spinozian being itself. And that has implications, and it has had long-lasting implications for our understanding of Spinoza's political theory. In short, Deleuze's interpretation restricts us to seeing Spinoza as an egalitarian in a political sense. And I think that way of reading Spinoza is quite wrong even though I think Deleuze's interpretation of Spinoza's metaphysics is broadly correct. Equality has an imminent structuring role in Spinoza's metaphysics, as we will see, but there is no direct line from this metaphysical sense of equality to any specific form of egalitarian politics. And this point is evident in Spinoza's thought, but has become difficult to see due to the dogmatic image of a Spinozian egalitarianism initiated by Deleuze. So here's the structure of the paper. There's a lot of sections, but they're all short, so um, we're not going to dwell on any of them very long. Um, and the PowerPoint will really just kind of take you through the structure, um, just you know, because it's the end of the conference and one needs a little reminder of where one is and how far <laughs> one has to go from time to time. So to start with, let me recap some of the basics of Spinoza's metaphysics. This may be very familiar to many of you already, but there's never any harm in going over it again. So Spinoza is, as you will surely know, a monist. He argues that there is one being that encompasses all the being that there is, and this one being is called God or nature or substance. And in this paper, I'm going to use the terms God and substance 
interchangeably when I'm talking about Spinoza. God or substance has an infinite essence that can be conceived in an infinite number of ways. And these ways that God's essence can be conceived are the attributes. Now, God conceives itself or himself perfectly. So there's no gap between what God is and how God is conceived. Since God conceives itself as its infinite number of attributes, God just is those attributes. God does not exist prior to the attributes or separately from the attributes. God just is the attributes. Now, we finite thinkers know God through two of these attributes, extension and thought. So that is substance conceived as physical being and substance conceived as thinking being. Because the attributes are different ways of conceiving the essence of one and the same substance, each attribute has the same content. Through each one, God's infinite essence plays out its being in the same order. And this results in what is known as Spinoza's parallelism. The attributes play out one and the same being in parallel streams. Specifically, the stream of physical being is parallel to the stream of physical being. All the infinite attributes are parallel, but those are the two that matter to us. And this means that for every body, there is an idea or a mind and vice versa. Now, the number of attributes is infinite, so God's essence unfolds through an infinite number of these parallel streams. The infinite bodies and minds that populate these streams are the modes, and specifically the finite modes. So from God's essence, there follows an infinite number of finite modes. Finite modes just are the determinate individuals that we know and love in our world, but uh, they don't only include physical bodies, they also include mental entities and ideas. Those two are finite modes. So finite modes, which are infinite in number, include ourselves and all of the particular and determinate things with which we are familiar. Now, due to monism, the modes are part of God. And due to parallelism, each mode follows from God's essence in every attribute in the same order and connection. So the same sequence of events happens in the attributes of extension and thinking and in every at other attribute as well, although those other attributes are unknown to us. Okay, that's as far as I'm going to go with Spinoza right now. That's his basic metaphysical structure, which is helpful to keep in mind as we now turn to Deleuze's interpretation of Spinoza's metaphysics. Okay, so in Expressionism in Philosophy, first published uh, in 1968, um, Deleuze interprets Spinoza in terms of the three guiding principles of univocity, expression, and imminence. Univocity means that all being is said in the same way. The being of God and the being of modes is the same being. By contrast, for other thinkers of the early modern tradition, being is equivocal or analogical. For Descartes, for example, the being of a finite mind is like God's being, and of course it carries the trademark of the transcendent creator. For Spinoza, by contrast, God is the imminent, not the transitive cause of all things, and whatever is, is in God. Two quotes from part one of the ethics. So the being of the modes is in the being of God, which causes their being in the same way that God causes its own being. Univocity then means that being, wherever and whatever it is, is characterized by a certain sameness. Deleuze's second principle is expression, which is how God plays out its essence. Spinoza tells us that each attribute expresses the being of substance in part one, proposition 10, scolium of the ethics. Because there are infinite attributes, there are infinite expressions of God's essence, which follow necessarily from God's nature. In other words, God's essence is necessarily differentiated into infinite forms. So, whereas univocity means that being is characterized by sameness, expression means that being is characterized by difference. Difference is, of course, not secondary to sameness, because substance cannot be without its attributes. 
there is no gap between substance and its attributes. So it's not the case that we have a sameness that then gets determined by difference. It's that sameness and difference are two sides of one and the same thing. There can be no sameness of substance that is prior to its differences. On Deleuze's interpretation of Spinoza then, being is characterized by its two equal sides, sameness and difference. Being is necessarily the same and being is necessarily differentiated. So we see that for Spinoza, in another Deleuzean phrase, monism is pluralism. The single voice of being necessarily sings in infinite keys. With this, we arrive at Deleuze's third principle of Spinoza interpretation, imminence. We can also call this a principle of equality. For Deleuze says that it is a principle of pure imminence, that being is equal in itself and is equally present in all beings. This means that the unity of substance is not superior to its forms. The sameness and oneness of being do not transcend or subsume its differences and plurality. The differences are not derivative of or inferior to the one. The sameness of being is equal to its difference. And all of the individual modes are equally effects of God and participate in God's being. So in a quote from Expressionism, beings are not defined by their rank in a hierarchy, are not more or less remote from the one, but each depends directly on God, participating in the equality of being, receiving immediately all that it is by its essence fitted to receive. So let's delve a little bit more deeply into this equality of being that Deleuze identifies. The phrase being is equal in itself indicates the equivalence of God's univocal sameness to God's differential expression. Sameness and difference are the two equal sides of God's being. Deleuze also speaks of God as having two equal powers the power of thinking and knowing, and the power of existing and acting. These are, in fact, just two different ways of saying the same thing. For God exists and acts through all the infinite attributes, but God only thinks and knows through one attribute, the attribute of thought. So to say that God's power of thinking is equal to God's power of existing and acting is really to say that the sameness of thinking is equal to the infinite differentiation of existence. I think I have another slide on this. No, I don't, sorry. <laughs> okay, so Spinoza explicitly names these two powers of God and their equality um, at Ethics Part 2, Proposition 7, Corollary. That's the um, parallelism proposition and the corollary to that. And that's where he says, God's actual power of thinking is equal to his actual power of acting. And the fact that Spinoza uses the word equal there has hardly been noticed by anyone. The word he uses is not identical, it's not the same, it's equal. Spinoza intends us to understand an equivalence between God's formal being, what God is in itself, and God's objective being, what God conceives itself to be. That's using the scholastic formal objective distinction which um, Spinoza himself makes use of. So Spinoza's insistence on equality here marks an important departure from Descartes, for whom objective being is always secondary to and derivative of formal being. So remember, formal being is that which the thing is in itself. Objective being is normally the representation of the thing, or in this context, the conception of the thing. For Descartes, the conception of the thing is always secondary. But for Spinoza, the, the important word here is equal. The two are equal to each other. God's power to conceive its own being is strictly equal to God's power to enact its own being. Now, God's power to enact its being plays itself out through infinite attributes. And Deleuze stresses that all of the attributes are equal in this regard. No attribute is superior or inferior to any other in its expression of God's essence. Every attribute is equally perfect. That is, each one is a complete unfolding of God's essence. 
the equality of the attributes is bound up with parallelism. All of the attributes unfold the same content in the same order. This means that the order and connection of modal relations is the same in all the attributes. A sequence of modes in one attribute is strictly equivalent to the same sequence of modes in another attribute. The modes are like a series of points connected by a line, and the line, or the series of relations in one attribute, is congruent with the line in every other attribute. In every attribute, the modes are determined to exist and act according to an equal law. God's power to exist and act, which evenly distributes being to all the modes in all the attributes in the same order and connection. So, in all that, what Deleuze actually identifies is three senses of equality in Spinoza's metaphysics. He actually separates these out himself, um, not in exactly the same terms that I've set them out here, but more or less. So, three senses of equality that he finds in Spinoza's metaphysics. First, we have the equivalence of sameness and difference, which can alternatively be called the equivalence of God's power of thinking to God's power of existing and acting. I should stress that that equivalence is not the equivalence of the attribute of thinking to the attribute of extension. It's actually the equivalence of the attribute of thinking to all the infinite attributes together. It's complicated. <laughs> okay, that's the first sense. The second sense is the even distribution of being among the attributes. And the third sense is the congruence of modal relations that emerges from an equal law. All of these senses of equality are strictly metaphysical. But Deleuze endows the second and the third senses with political connotations. Now, Spinoza clearly does hold that no attribute has any more being or reality than any other. In the appendix to the short treatise, one of his early texts, Spinoza remarks that there is no inequality at all in the attributes, meaning that all the attributes contain the essences of all the modes. That is, they all have the same amount of being, they all have the same complexity, they all express the same modes in the same order. Deleuze, however, uses this same quote as evidence for a different point. He argues that this very line, there is no inequality at all in the attributes, means that there is no hierarchy among the attributes. He stresses that no attribute is superior to any other. Now, clearly it follows from the ontological equality of the attributes that there is no hierarchy of being among them. Right? Spinoza means that none is more real, none is closer to God than any other. But Deleuze implies further that no attribute is sovereign over any other. This becomes clear from the contrast he draws with Descartes. For Descartes, the attribute of thinking is superior to the attribute of extension. And thinking transcends and governs extension. Spinoza, Deleuze implies, holds the contrasting view that the attributes are political equals. All are equal under God's power, and no attribute is or can be sovereign among them. We find more political language in Deleuze's claim that the attributes make possible a formal community between God and the modes. Formal community stems from univocity. Since the attributes are the forms of being shared by God and the modes, God and the modes are in a formal community. And if God and the modes share a formal community, then God has no sovereign authority over the modes. And after all, Spinoza says that the power of God is nothing like the power of kings. And concomitantly, the community of all the finite modes in the universe is nothing like a kingdom of ends. Perhaps then Kant is the unspoken contrast case that Deleuze intends here. Kant says explicitly that God stands above the kingdom of ends. God cannot be a member of the kingdom of ends. By contrast, Spinoza's God does not stand above or transcend the community of modes, but rather shares a community with his creatures. 
In this way, the principle of equality, which has a strictly metaphysical sense in Spinoza's text, is subtly politicized by Deleuze. The effect of this is to exclude the idea of sovereign authority from the essence of substance. Effectively, Deleuze says that there can be no idea of sovereignty in the nature of being. First, because there is no hierarchy or dominance among the forms of being, the attributes. And second, because there is no transcendence or separation between being and beings. In other words, there's a formal community between God and the modes. If sovereign authority is excluded from the essence of substance, then according to Spinoza's logic, it can only be an inadequate idea, an idea that we imagine an idea that has no true basis in God's essence. So Deleuze effectively claims or implies that Spinoza's philosophy of imminence could not possibly give rise to a politics based on sovereign authority, and that insofar as we human beings introduce the notion of sovereign authority, that reflects a highly confused way of thinking. On this reading, the only kind of politics that can legitimately emerge from Spinoza's metaphysics is one that is radically egalitarian. This means that no individual, not even God, is authoritative over any other. God gives the law to the modes, not through sovereign right, but through the necessity of his nature, such that modes follow the same law that God follows, and every mode is determined to follow that law, the true order and connection of modal relationships in every attribute. The universe, then, is not naturally governed by sovereign authority, but by the relations that drive each mode to be and to act. Now, this interpretation is consistent with Deleuze's understanding of the politics of imminence, at least as far as I understand it. Whereas philosophies of transcendence are concerned with the authoritative imposition and regulation of liberties, rights, and equalities, philosophies of imminence focus on the genesis of social and political systems from relations and desires. In A Thousand Plateaus, Deleuze and Guattari state that politics precedes being. I take this to mean that there is no state of affairs for them that precedes social and political forces. Rather, desiring relations of bodies exercise potentialities and form social and political forces that constitute the forms of being. For Spinoza, all the potentialities are God's potentialities. So social and political forces emerge from the nature of being itself, disseminated through the powers of individual finite modes. For Deleuze, Spinoza's ontology is therefore practical and political from the start. It is, of course, Antonio Negri who most forcefully takes this up and argues that Spinoza's metaphysics necessitates a non-hierarchical and anti-authoritarian theory of political community. Negri follows Deleuze in holding that Spinoza's philosophy of imminence negates every presupposed ordering of the constitution of being and knows no hierarchies. Spinoza's God imminently produces social and political forms because God is power, understood as productive and constitutive potentia, not as the sovereign power of potestas. This means that political systems are not artificially constituted or externally imposed by a social contract, a sovereign, or a general will. Instead, they are produced by potentia, the productive and constitutive power that the finite modes are. Thus, for Negri, Spinoza's God imminently contains potentialities for revolutionary politics, potentialities that can be realized through the potentia of the modes acting communally. Whenever human beings establish or perpetuate authoritarian and hierarchical forms of politics, we get it wrong. We do something contrary to our nature and to the nature of the universe. Thus, for both Negri and Deleuze, Spinoza's metaphysics necessarily contains and gives rise to non-hierarchical, 
anti-authoritarian, egalitarian, and communal forms of politics. These forms are the best and most natural ones because they are determined to emerge from substance itself. And oddly, the Deleuze-Negri reading is not far off the view of Jonathan Israel, who argues that liberal democracy is the best and most natural political system because it emerges necessarily from monistic metaphysics. Now, I think this is the wrong way to interpret Spinoza's political philosophy. And most basically, it's wrong because Spinoza's political philosophy looks nothing like this. It's also wrong for a sort of methodological reason, because it restricts us in what we can do politically with Spinoza's metaphysics. If we follow Deleuze and Negri, we can only see some kinds of politics as natural. And this, I think, is dangerous for diagnosing our current political situation. It's important to remind ourselves that for Spinoza, everything is part of nature. And I mean everything. Every human desire and action is natural, not just the liberating and joyful ones, but also the resentful and angry and repressive ones. Hierarchy is just as natural as equality. And fascism is just as natural as democracy. The Deleuze-Negri reading suggests that some forms of political organization, some way of constituting human communities, is the best or right way because it is embedded in substance itself. But Spinoza's substance is utterly indifferent to how human beings organize themselves politically, or even if we do so. From God's point of view, nothing is good or bad, better or worse or more or less natural or perfect. Spinoza is clear that joining with other human beings in communities is good, but it's only good from the human standpoint. The right way to configure our communities depends on us, depends on how that group of human beings can best preserve and maintain themselves, depending on their particular material and historical circumstances, the passions and imaginaries they are subject to, and how they believe they can enhance their capacities to act and think well. There is no natural form of political state and no universal formula. Depending on the circumstances, monarchy or theocracy may be preferable to democracy, as Spinoza shows through many examples. Now, perhaps Deleuze and Negri's point is not that a specific type of state is embedded in Spinoza's substance but rather that Spinoza presents us with a non-authoritarian way for politics to be constituted, that is, through the potentia of the multitude. As long as we do not reintroduce transcendence by repressing or legislating for potentia, we will end up with the political forms that do emerge naturally from our desires and relations. But this too, I think, is profoundly anti-Spinozistic. There's no reason to think that potentia will generate progressive or egalitarian political forms, or that unleashed desire will lead to freedom or flourishing. On Spinoza's view, unrestrained and unguided desire has almost the opposite tendency. It's only when desire is accompanied by rational understanding of what is truly good for our nature that it pushes us towards those encounters that preserve, enhance, and increase our power. Without rational understanding, our desires will be determined by imaginaries and passions, which range from the harmless to those that can be deeply damaging to ourselves and others. Rational understanding is not easy or straightforward to achieve. To build it up, we need to seek positive encounters, but we need much more than that. We need guidance and education. We need to practice the management of our passions and desires, and we need the help of others to do that. Truly becoming powerful for Spinoza does not mean potentia unleashed, but the careful cultivation and development of potentia in line with rational understanding. As we become more powerful actors and thinkers, we understand that it is good for us to help others to do the same. Spinoza's view is that each one should become as powerful as he or she can be in the circumstances, and that those who are most powerful in the sense of enhancing and exercising their potentia 
should assume power in the sense of potestas. That is, those who are most rational are best placed to rule others, precisely because they understand best how to manage the passions, mitigate selfish behavior, and rationally guide desires. This allows us to understand Spinoza's defense of authority and hierarchy. Authority, when exercised well, is the rational management of desires and powers, helping us to avoid damages to our potentia by passions and imaginaries that simply accrue to us because we are part of nature. The best way to organize human beings is therefore for the most rational to lead the least. Spinoza states that if a society could guarantee that the most rational would always be in charge, aristocracy, ruled by the best, would in fact be the best and most preferable form of government. So while an egalitarian democracy could emerge from the collection, uh, sorry, from the collective action of human potentia, Spinoza does not think that it is any more natural than the forms of monarchy, aristocracy, and theocracy that have emerged historically. And it would not be good for us unless we could guarantee that all were highly rational. If we believe that Spinoza's metaphysics only leads in the direction of egalitarian politics, then we will tend to see the emergence of authoritarian political forms as unnatural, illusory, or as misunderstandings of the true nature of things. And if we do that, we miss an opportunity to use Spinoza to diagnose and understand the political forms that we do not like. Those political forms emerge just as naturally as the ones we do like. And Spinoza's philosophy can help us understand why they do so. Anthropogenic climate change, for example, is a natural effect of human beings collectively seeking their advantage. Spinoza's philosophy allows us to understand that the political forms that follow are natural too. Nationalist populism, for example, could be a natural effect of collective human fear of our collective human power. That does not make populism the right response to our predicament, but nor does Spinoza's philosophy entail that anti-authoritarian anarchy, or indeed any other political form, is the right response either. We can only determine what is right for us by developing better rational understanding of our situation and how to organize ourselves so that human beings can flourish best under these challenging circumstances. Let me come back to equality. I think that Deleuze is right that Spinoza embeds a metaphysical concept of equality in his system. I agree with Deleuze that equality as the equivalence of sameness and difference plays a foundational metaphysical role for Spinoza. In fact, I think it plays such an important foundational role that the book I'm writing is going to be about that concept. But my own view, which I'm going to be developing at length in that book, is that this concept of equality comes from Euclid. Euclid states that two ratios equal to each other are proportionate. So proportionality, this geometrical kind of equality, allows us to think sameness and difference together. Proportion or geometrical equality is an important operator in Spinoza's work, and we find it operating in lots of places throughout his metaphysics. In fact, sticking to this strictly metaphysical and geometrical concept opens up a more promising route to understanding Spinoza's doctrine of politics. I can't go over that whole theory here, of course, so let me just very briefly take you through some of the steps that might lead us from geometry to politics according to this way of thinking. One of the ways that we see geometrical equality at work is in Spinoza's theory of bodies. So for Spinoza, every body consists of parts, and he states that each part of a body has its own characteristic ratio of motion and rest. But at the same time, the whole body has its own characteristic ratio of motion and rest. 
And what that means is that all the parts of a body share a common ratio that makes the whole what it is. So you have a body with all these different ratios, but all the different ratios all have to equal the same ratio. In order for all the individual ratios to combine into one overarching ratio, those ratios must be geometrically equal. They must be both the same and different, and they must be proportionate to one another. Each body strives to maintain its geometrical equality. That is, to maintain its overall ratio, to maintain its proportionality, to maintain the agreement of its parts with each other. So a well-functioning body is equal in itself in this geometrical and proportional sense. Now every body combines with every other body to form larger bodies, and the whole of physical nature, as Spinoza says, is one infinitely extended body, which as such has one overarching ratio. This means that all finite bodies must in some sense be geometrically equal to each other. So geometrical equality pervades nature. It's built in to the relational structure that we dwell in. And it allows things to combine and agree with one another and indeed to work together in productive ways. Now if we agree with Alexandra Matheron and with other Spinoza interpreters that a political community is a form of physical body, that is a group of bodies acting together under a common ratio, then we can see how communities and states are similarly structured by geometrical equality from the start. So Deleuze is right that all finite modes are equal. And he's right that a fundamental equality characterizes political forms that emerge organically from our acting in common. But crucially, the kind of equality that necessarily characterizes political forms is a strictly metaphysical and geometrical kind of equality. We don't need political concepts to be smuggled into the metaphysics in order to make sense of that move. So geometrical equality tells us nothing about the political, moral, or social equality of the individuals in these groups. To say that people are naturally geometrically equal is just to make a claim that individuals can agree with one another and can work together coherently and consistently under a common ratio to solve problems and seek common goods. Geometrical equality can and does give rise to some other kinds of equality. And that's because the best human community is one that features high levels of agreement. It features a coherent and consistent overarching ratio. A human community aims to maintain its geometrical equality. And strategies for achieving this will likely include principles such as equality under the law and especially economic equality. These forms of equality do a lot to quell the passions and make people live and behave in the same kinds of ways, something that Spinoza takes to be very important for the stability of a state. But geometrical equality does not automatically lead to a thoroughgoing egalitarianism. And it would, in fact, be perfectly possible to have a geometrically equal society, that is, one in which bodies and minds agree to a great extent, without featuring moral, social, or political equality. Political and economic equality, to the extent that they are important for human societies, do not emerge naturally from the interrelation of bodies. These principles must be imposed externally on people through the rule of law. And Spinoza thinks it's a good idea to impose those rules externally, but they are imposed externally. They're human inventions and they're imposed for the sake of achieving human ends. Geometrical equality, however, is a principle that's imminent to the nature of substance. It's imminent to the nature of nature itself, on Spinoza's view. It structures God, the attributes, and the finite modes. Interpreting Spinoza through geometrical equality is, I think, therefore, more helpful than Deleuze's principle of imminent political equality. It allows us to make sense of Spinoza's pro-hierarchical and anti-egalitarian positions while also giving us the opportunity to ground the kinds of equality that matter to Spinoza, especially economic equality. And it allows us to see equality as having variable forms through Spinoza's corpus that can be found anywhere where we seem to encounter insuperable problems of sameness and difference or of oneness and plurality. Thank you very much.
here first, then we'll do four. Uh, very lucid interpretation uh, of Spinoza. It's admirable. Uh, I was almost convinced until uh, the chiasmus, until you falsified the Deleuze. <laughs> I guess uh, uh, Euclidean uh, geometry, uh, as I see it, uh, is a side effect of the phonetic alphabet. I guess uh, the word ratio is irrationality. You are right about it. Etymolo etymologically, <laughs> it's very Euclidean. Uh, that's why it's wrong. Uh, that's why I stand. I continue to. Uh, I'm inclined toward Deleuze, even if he uh, had Spinoza wrong. Uh, I guess I like the Deleuzean version of Spinoza uh, eventually as a kind of political philosophy. I admire uh, your systematic, you know. <laughs> lucid way. Uh, I guess you you performed lucidity today. It's amazing, but uh, I disagree with your conclusion. I guess <laughs> I have problems with that. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> thank you <laughs> for the compliment. Um, obviously, that's fine. Uh, you know, there's many interpretations of Spinoza, and of course we can disagree about that. Um, I, I guess that um, something that strikes me about um, Deleuze and Deleuzean readings of Spinoza is that, um, that that element of reason is, is often missing from the interpretation. And I don't want to come across as a sort of overarching rationalist or something. I'm, I'm not that. I'm very sympathetic to Deleuze's reading of Spinoza in many ways. But I think that any reading of Spinoza that wants to get rid of reason is a, is a bad interpretation of Spinoza. I, I don't see how you can lose that from his system. It's centrally important to him. Um, so the notion of ratio, which yes, has, has several meanings. It, it refers to mathematical ratio and geometrical ratio. It refers to reason, it refers to rationales, it refers to causality. Um, there's, there's a number of ways that we can use that concept. All of those concepts are really important to Spinoza. And, um, and so I, I worry about interpretations of Spinoza that, that want to get rid of that. Um, so so that, that was one of the points I wanted to stress. I think we'll move on. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, I was Wait, wondering. Can the speaker wave? I can't. I'd like oh, to be able sure. To sorry. Oh, yeah, <laughs> there I am. Uh, I was wondering um, because you you have this plea for equality um, to interpret Spinoza, and I was always thinking about uh, Chantal Jacquet and yeah. her uh, critique of parallelism yeah. and her plea for understanding <laughs> Spinoza in terms of equality and not in terms of parallelism, which is a notion that he doesn't use at all. Um, and she says that the parallelism or this, this notion of parallelism is incompatible with the notion of equality and uh, that you understand uh, the relation between the attributes in a totally different way if you view it in terms of equality. So I was wondering how, would you, how you would respond to this critique. Uh. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Jacquet is one of the few people who does recognize the importance of that term. I should have name-checked her when I was making that comment. Um, and I think I need to engage with her work more. I, I haven't fully sort of engaged with her argument. So partly I was using the word parallelism here just because it's a shorthand. Most people understand what that means. It doesn't necessarily mean that I subscribe to the view that Spinoza is a parallelist. So I think that I probably agree with her that the, the right way to think about it is in terms of the equality of mind and body. Um, and part of my project will be to explore how, how using that term in that context allows us to think differently about some of the problems that have arisen. So, yeah, I'll, I'll look that up further. Thank you.
Uh, hi. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I thought that was a very powerful and convincing. I think it's on. <laughs> I never get it. Uh, convincing uh, way to see it. And I, I think uh, many will disagree with me here, but it's important to dissociate uh, Spinoza and Deleuze. And um, the reason, and it is uh, very f rarely mentioned, but uh, in different and repetition, Deleuze criticizes Spinoza at two very important passages. One is where he says, university must be said of mods, modes and modes alone and not of substance. And the other one is where, in a footnote where he says that in Spinoza, where he speaks about thought as being forced to think, he speaks that in Spinoza we don't find any problem. So there's no problem that forces us to think in the Deleuzean sense mm -hmm. of a disequilibrium. And it is rather uh, a Nietzsche, the Kantian abstract form of time, and Freudian death drive that kind of brings us there. So, and now many say that kind of uh, in, in his work on with Guattari, he kind of returns and then he suddenly speaks of Spinoza as the prince and he returns to Spinoza. But in his later works, he again returns to the problem of time. So the thing is, I, I, yeah, I don't see him as a Spinozist in this sense. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so I hadn't, I hadn't picked up on those two remarks in difference and repetition. I'll have to go and look those up. Um, this, the second one that you named seems particularly interesting. So the notion that, say again, that so there's no, there's no problem that sparks there's us no to think. He, he says there's no problem in, in Spinoza. There's no problem. Yeah, and, and is that because there's, there's nothing external to thought that would cause yeah, thought I to guess. come into yeah. action or something like that? Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's really interesting and, um, and yeah, is something that, that, that one would have to think about in terms of reconciling Deleuze's appreciation of Spinoza in the Spinoza book and, and the project that he has in Difference and Repetition, which sometimes those projects seem very consonant and sometimes they seem very divergent. So, um, yeah, that, thank you for the reference. I'll, I'll, I'll follow that up. Hi, um, thank you so much for the talk. It was uh, really enlightening for me and helped me, um, I guess, personally process why Deleuze respects Spinoza so much. Um, I guess my question for you is, um, is this dangerous interpretation or dangerous reading um, of Spinoza um, a critique of Deleuze? Do you think Deleuze falls into this trap or is this a criticism that um, we as Deleuzeans who do work on Deleuze and Spinoza should be wary of? Um, because if it's the first, and the, um, it seems as if that Deleuze processes this himself and uh, tries to sidestep this, especially in his um, works with Guattari on capitalism and schizophrenia, mm -hmm. um, when he talks about how there is only one state, and that's the Erstadt, and all different types of states are merely different attempts at becoming that Erstadt. And so in that sense, it seems like he's not prioritizing any one type of political theory as being prior or the ideal, but that there are simply just different types of political theory and that they all exist in the uh, cartography of political theory? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess I wasn't trying to make a claim about Deleuze's political theory, you know, writ large, because I, I'm really not an expert in that. It was more about um, the reading of Spinoza and the uh, reading a particular political reading into Spinoza sort of right from the start of looking at his ontology. So, so do I think Deleuze himself is guilty of this? Yes, up to a point I do. I think it's more apparent um, in, the, in the Practical Philosophy book, um, which is a book I love, by the way. I mean, I, you know, it, it's the first interpretation of Spinoza I read. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's very foundational for my own thinking. But I do think that reading that book, as many of us do as our first entree into Spinoza, does pitch our view of Spinoza's politics in a certain way. And then you read Negri, and then you read Mathuron, and then you read all these other thinkers who have followed in his wake, and they're all kind of going in that same line. And then you go back to Spinoza, and you, th and you realize, hang on, this is, this, is not, this is not what Spinoza's doing. This is not Spinoza's project at all. Um, so, so yes, I do, I do think it's Deleuze. But I also think it's readers of Deleuze. Um, it's, 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 it's the whole, you know, the, the whole sort of... Uh, 
group of us, I guess, who, who need to read Spinoza more carefully if we want to, to understand what Spinoza has to say about politics, not to just take Deleuze's word for it, I suppose. Um, but nevertheless, to find rich resources in Deleuze's reading of Spinoza um, to, to help us to understand the text, but to understand it maybe, maybe in a slightly, I don't know, less biased way, I guess. Thank you very much uh, for your talk. Um, I'm, I'm here. Um, so um, I remember Dolos's practi uh, practical philosophy book uh, in terms of what he says about the body being the new model. Body is the model now and so forth. And that is juxtaposed against thought. But it seems that uh, your critique of um, Dolos, uh, like Dolosian reading of Spinoza, body being prioritized almost over thought, is, is this um, the kind of gesta, gesture that you're making? And by saying that uh, rationalist, the, the, <coughs> the aspect of reason is, is lacking and so forth, is that, uh, are you maybe prioritizing thought over body? Or, or um, is, is it about balancing well, I'm, the I'm, two? I'm that not is right consciously reason? doing that. I, mean, I, might be, I might be doing that. I mean, I, yeah, okay, so, so I guess two separate points. I, I do think there's a tendency to use Deleuze as the basis of a heavily materialist reading of Spinoza, which I don't think is correct. I didn't really talk about that today. That wasn't the focus of the paper. I don't think Spinoza is a materialist, right? He, Spinoza thinks the mind and the body are equal, as we just saw. Um, the, the, the mind and reason and ideas are as important as bodies. So, so I think that any account that wants to sort of reduce one to the other is, is wrong. Um, so I don't think the materialist reading is right. Um, the po my point about reason was a slightly different point. So it, it wasn't, I wasn't trying to make the claim that reason is more important than the body or something like that. I think I was trying to make the point that um, many accounts of uh, Deleuzean Spinozism um, really focus on, um, on kind of flows of, of desire and on joyful affects and, and on effective relations. All that stuff is important. But in Spinoza, reason is really important too. It's really important to how we manage all that stuff. And so I think the point that I was trying to make was that, was that reason as a principle um, needs to be taken some account of in, in, these, in these interpretations. That, that was the point there. So whether I prioritize reason, I mean, I'm a bit of an idealist re reader of Spinoza, so yeah, probably I do a bit, but um, I, it wasn't intentional here. <laughs> Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I have uh, a short, not even half-baked, maybe unbaked, whatever, raw commentary, because you mentioned the uh, uh, principle of, of geometrical equality, right? And I wonder what would happen or if that would make any change in your argument if you would replace such a kind of Euclidean conception with a non-Euclidean, with a kind of more topological, because what then would happen maybe would be a kind of how would you call it, uh, you would imply a kind of non-oppositional logic, right? So it, it's more like, it's not sameness versus difference, mm -hmm. but sameness and difference on, on a kind of continuum. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that would change anything, and if it yes, into which well. direction? Yeah, it might very well. I mean, I, d I simply don't, you know, don't know enough about that. Um, I mean, wh why Euclidean geometry? Well, obviously, Spinoza, like all right. early modern thinkers, was hugely influenced by Euclid. He's extremely important for him. Spinoza is also very um, influenced by Hobbes, who himself embeds a really Euclidean geometrical notion of bodies, and that's, that's why I'm tracing that route in particular. Um, I, I think it may be beyond my mathematical abilities to get into <laughs> to non-Euclidean geometries, but undoubtedly there's something interesting there, which I, I, hope, I hope somebody will develop. <laughs> it's not because me, I, I think. Even in Hobbes, you would have the same problem. Yeah, I'm sure right? it would so be. I'm sure it would be. I'd love to, I'd love to learn more about that, but um, yeah, not something I know about. Hello. There was a move that you made that I really appreciated because it's a it's a kind of move that's sort of my MO for doing philosophical work when you're when you're saying that this is the interpretation that you're speaking of, of Deleuze's of Spinoza's that it's a wrong interpretation. Part of what it means to say that it's wrong isn't simply that 
I don't know. It's misrep. It's not only misrepresenting what's on on the page, but you're making a distinction of if it reduces our capacity to understand or make sense of what's around us or mm -hmm. organize in certain <coughs> different ways, then we ought to be wary of that move. So. What I was wondering...